This is a male albino bristlenose placostomus. In many parts of the world, the bristlenose is also known as the ancestress catfish. There are currently over 75 different species of bristlenose, and new ones are being discovered every year. There are also many different selectively bred varieties, such as the super red, the calico, the albinos, and the long-finned albinos, just to name a few. Nonetheless, the lives of all bristlenose catfish begins in the egg. So, let's start there. Bristlenose plecos are cavity spawners. They lay their eggs in large cracks and gaps in rocks, as well as under submerged trees and boulders. They'll even use their tail to move the substrate in order to create their own cavities for spawning. The eggs seen in this cave are only a few minutes old, and they are being cared for by the male. Once the egg has been fertilized, a chain reaction is set in motion and a tiny catfish begins to take form. However, unlike the eggs of humans where a sperm can enter the egg at any location along its surface, the typical fish egg has only one opening where the sperm can enter. That opening, known as the micropile, can be seen here at the center of this indentation. Be sure to notice the multiple grooves that extend radially from the center of the micropile. These grooves make fertilization more effective by channeling the sperm along the surface of the egg until one lucky swimmer reaches the micropile. This egg was fertilized about six hours ago and a tiny catfish is beginning to take form on the surface of the yolk. This early stage of development is known as the embryonic ridge. If you're viewing this on a large screen and you look carefully, there is movement even at this early stage of development. Less than two days after fertilization and the tiny catfish can now be seen moving on the surface of the yolk. Three days after fertilization and the baby catfish looks like this. At 79 degrees, my ancestress eggs take about four days to hatch. Those little black dots are the eyes. The eggs seen here are from two different females who spawned with the same male within a few hours of each other. It's not uncommon to have one male caring for more than one female's eggs at the same time. The eggs on the left have developed a fungus and it has now started to spread to some of the eggs on the right. I suspect that it may have been caused by my exposing the eggs to bright light during filming. Luckily, these eggs are going to hatch very soon. Just before hatching, many fish make the initial tear in the egg membrane using their powerful tail muscles. The bristlenose pleco has a very different strategy. Instead of using its tail to break free of the egg, the bristlenose uses its oversized yolk sac to make the first tear in the egg membrane. Once the initial tear is made, all that is required are a few twists and turns by the tail and the little fish begins to break free. Be sure to notice the dark eyes inside these three eggs. Those are chocolate-colored bristlenose fry. Now observe the clear eyes on this individual. It's an albino, and strangely enough, both of its parents are chocolate-colored. Still, approximately one quarter of their offspring are albino. Watch this egg closely and you'll be able to see the yolk sac making the initial tear in the egg membrane. The eggs that developed the fungus have survived and are hatching right on schedule. And yes, in case you're wondering, this little one is fine and it hatches without any problems.
After hatching, the wrigglers use their incredibly well-developed mouths to attach themselves to the walls and ceiling of the cave. By contrast, the German blue ram doesn't even have a mouth when it's born. Watch as the bristlenose wrigglers burst from the egg and use their mouth to attach to the side of the cave. It's amazing how well they can swim from the moment they're born. This one down here has already hatched, but he's holding on to one of his siblings. It helps to have a mouth that's designed like a suction cup. Here's another group of eggs in the midst of hatching. Keep your eye on this little catfish. It takes about two to three hours for all of the eggs to hatch. The wrigglers of the bristlenose placostomus are very self-sufficient right from birth. They're born with fully functioning mouths which they use to keep themselves attached to the walls and ceiling of the cave. And perhaps most importantly, they're born with the amazing ability to move around with speed, purpose, and control. In fact, they pretty much take care of themselves. I believe that the wrigglers of the bristlenose are born in this advanced stage of development as an evolutionary response to the limitations created by the development of the suction cup-like mouth. While having a mouth designed like a suction cup does offer many advantages, it also creates a few problems. The most troublesome of these problems is that this mouth design prevents the male from picking up the babies in his mouth. So, if one of his children wanders away from the group, there's nothing that he can do to bring it back. In order to make up for this lack of parental control, bristlenose wrigglers are born with an impressive array of skills right from the beginning. The first and most obvious feature of these newborn fish is that they're quite capable of getting around on their own, and it's also very obvious that their suction cup mouths are fully functioning right from birth. Before we begin this next round of footage, it's important to keep in mind that the wrigglers you will be seeing were just born and are only two or three hours old. The male seen here is about to start clearing away the empty egg membranes that remain after hatching. He's trying to eat the membranes, but his mouth is poorly suited for the task. Watch closely as he disturbs one of the wrigglers. Notice how quickly and skillfully the wriggler moves to avoid danger. The wrigglers of the bristlenose catfish are far more self-sufficient than any cichlid wriggler that I've ever seen. And the simple fact is that bristlenose wrigglers need to be more self-sufficient because their father can't pick them up in his mouth. Oh, there's the face, and here comes the female. The 
This is a hole in the side of the cave and it leads to the outside world. One day a tiny orange wriggler, just like the one seen here, made its way out through that hole. At that point in time, the tank contained a large female angelfish who immediately saw the bright orange wriggler, swam over, ate it, and then quickly spit it out. She tried to eat the same wriggler three or four more times, but each time it was rejected. A second angelfish in a different tank had the same response to the little orange wrigglers. These limited observations have led me to suspect that the early stage orange wrigglers of the bristlenose pleco are at the very least unpalatable. And their bright orange color may be an example of what's known as aposematic coloration. Simply put, aposematic coloration is the use of conspicuous colors, typically yellow, orange, or red, to announce to potential predators that a particular food item is not good to eat. Keep your eye on this little wriggler. It's about to shoot out through this hole in the side of the cave. And that's how I discovered that these wrigglers are unpalatable to my angelfish. However, once the babies turn brown like their parents, the angelfish eats them without hesitation. These wrigglers were born just a few hours ago. Be sure to notice their tiny pectoral fins. This little one has attached itself to the glass, giving us a clear view of the two-chambered heart and the large vessels along the surface of the yolk. These vessels bring nutrients from the yolk to the heart where they are then distributed to all the cells in the body via the bloodstream. Notice the pink blood-filled area around the gills. Fluids can be seen moving through the vessels along the yolk. Unfortunately, the rhythmic breathing of these little fish makes it difficult to get clear and steady footage of their bloodstream. The little fry seen here is just four days old. These four light areas are where the multiple rows of teeth will be formed. The cat-like whiskers that most people associate with catfish are very much reduced in the ancestress. The whiskers, more properly known as barbels, are limited to these two small ones at the corners of the mouth. The upper and lower lips are enlarged to form the disc-like suction cup. Be sure to notice how far down the lower lip extends and how its edges are scalloped in order to help ensure proper adhesion on uneven surfaces. This large disc-like suction cup helps to ensure that the fry can maintain their position in the nesting cavity and that they are not swept away in the current. Unfortunately, the need to create a tight seal for proper suction interferes with the bristlenose's ability to bring water in through its mouth so that it can be passed over the gills. Here again, we can see how the use of its mouth as a suction cup has created a problem. The bristlenose solves the problem by restricting the flow of water into its mouth to a single small channel located just behind the barbel. The barbel moves and controls the intake of water so that a tight seal can be maintained while still breathing. In order to help it form a tight seal, the bristlenose only brings water in through one side of its mouth at a time. Researchers have confirmed this by introducing a diluted solution of milk near the pleco's mouth. The diluted milk allows the scientists to see the movement of the water as the pleco breathes in and out. These are the upper teeth and the lower teeth. There are multiple rows of teeth on both the upper jaw and the lower jaw. Be sure to notice the multiple fleshy bumps that allow the bristlenose to stick to almost any surface. And yes, those teeth will scratch acrylic tanks. 
Watch closely as the bristlenose is about to yawn. And now again in slow motion. Be sure to notice the bottom row of teeth pulling away from the lower lip. The upper and lower teeth can almost touch each other. While we're on the subject of teeth, instead of having scales, the bristlenose has overlapping bony plates that cover most of the body. These bony plates are covered with tiny, sharp teeth known as odontodes, or dermal teeth. These dermal teeth have the same composition as a human tooth. They point backwards and help the catfish lock themselves into crevices where they may be holding eggs or guarding fry. These teeth also function as anchors or gripping devices to help the fish maintain its position in a turbulent river. The armor-plated skin, adorned with sharp teeth, also helps to deter predators. Another weapon in the ancestral arsenal are the enlarged spines located on the leading edges of both the pectoral and the ventral fins. These spines serve the dual purpose of helping the fish lock itself into place as well as being used in self-defense in territorial conflicts with other males. Both the pectoral and the ventral fins are also covered with sharp teeth. And finally, in between all of these teeth are taste buds. Lots and lots of taste buds. In fact, the skin of the bristlenose catfish is covered in taste buds and teeth, which might explain their appetite. The final bit of armor are extra-large teeth hidden away near the gill plates that can be extended when the fish feels threatened. And now, here are the hidden teeth in action. Be sure to notice that these particular teeth are flattened so that they can be folded together in a more compact fashion. These large cheek teeth, as well as the teeth on their bodies, can sometimes get caught in our nets. If your bristle nose does get caught in a net, don't try to pull it out. Just leave the net and the fish in the tank. They will usually free themselves within a few minutes. The cheek teeth on this albino male are designed very differently than the teeth in the chocolate male. These catfish also have a special feature in their eyes known as an omega iris. The omega iris controls the amount of light entering the eye by contracting or expanding downward over the pupil, causing the pupil to sometimes take the shape of a crescent moon. This albino male is under bright light. Notice how far down the omega iris has extended in order to reduce the amount of light entering the eye.
Be sure to notice that the armor-plated skin and the pointy dermal teeth extend all the way down the body right to the tail fin. Even though these fry are more than capable of moving all around the cave, there's always a lot of pushing and shoving trying to find a good place to hold on to near the top. Soon, these little ones will be able to join their older brothers and sisters outside the cave. By the end of the fifth day, some of the fry have wandered away from the cave, and by the end of day seven, most of the fry have left home to start a life on their own. This concludes part one of the video. Please be sure to join me for part two and part three.